And I wanted to talk to you tonight about something that's really powerful. And I think it's something that a lot of spiritual, spiritual people actually take for granted. And they don't recognize it as the magical tool that it truly is. And this is prayer. Prayer. And the reason I think a lot of us don't recognize it for the magical tool that it is, is because we came up through organized religion, right? Where we sang songs like, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. Organized religion does a great job in programming into us this invalidating unworthiness that we kind of have to beg in order to ask for what it is that we want. We're wretches. We got to go to the altar, man. We got to drop on our knees. We got to self flagellate and genuflect and gang signs, man. We got to get up in front of the altar and we got to do all these motions and we got to cry and we got to come like beggars. Truly, we've got to come like beggars in order to ask for what we want. Well, this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to talk about how that is absolutely the wrong way to do it. That's not the way that we create the reality that we want to experience. In order to manifest what we truly want to experience, we have to come into the interaction as an equal. Because that, my friend, is exactly what we are. When we pray, we pray to God. We pray to Creator. We pray to the angels as an equal as our divine self, fully empowered and emboldened to be in that, well, I want to say community, but in that communal state with God. And, and I was just talking to a friend and she was telling me that, and it was cool, and, and I know this, and you're going to know this, but I never think of it this way. She said, prayer is communication. Communication comes from the word to commune. What does it mean to commune? Well, I looked it up and I'd, I'd, I'd read it right now, but my husband took over, commandeered my computer. If I recall correctly, it's essentially sharing in an intimate way with another person. And usually it's a spiritual interaction. It's a deep relationship that we have with somebody where we are commingling our very essences. That's what communing means. And communication is something that arises or emerges out of this communion. And prayer is a type of communication. It's a type of transmission that spirit sends to us and we send to spirit. It goes both ways that arises out of the divine communion that we have with our creator. It is a powerful, magical tool. And so we're going to learn about it tonight. I'm pumped because why? We're going to go... We're going to go to the Goddard. We should just call this go into the Goddard tonight. We're going to the Goddard. I'm pulling out the resurrection book, which I recommend that each and every one of you watching this purchases, whether that's on Audible, which I have it on Audible, Kindle, which I have it on Kindle, or an actual book, which I have the actual book. You should have this because it is filled with so much good information. Now, just as kind of a warning, Neville Goddard writes in an old-timey, antiquated fashion. And so as we read his writing about prayer, which is transformational, I am going to periodically stop and kind of explain what it is he's trying to explain to us. And I'm also going to expand on some of the things that he's talking about, because I don't agree on every single thing that Goddard says, although almost truly. But where I want to add in my own little zhuzh, I'm going to do that. But this is coming straight out of Resurrection, which is a compilation book. I think there's six to eight of Goddard's books or, or speeches contained in this one book. And tonight we're going to be learning out of the book Prayer, the Art of Believing. And I just want to tell you, because this is what I found in my own experience, that... The words as he wrote them, this cat was for sure channeling. He was for sure channeling. And the words as he wrote them and the words as I read them are codings for us. C-O-D-I-N-G. And what I mean by that is we can actually be gridded to be a match for the information and truth coming through this teaching. We can actually be coded to or programmed to receive and integrate the truth of what's coming through. Some of which, again, might sound old timey, but it kind of doesn't matter. If you are open to receive the message of it and the programming of it and the activation within it, you will do that. And if you'd like to do that, I think you should say yes. 
I'd like that. Yes, I want that. And as we go through this work, we'll probably do two chapters, maybe three. It's a brief work, which is what I love about God. Or he keeps it short. He doesn't go on and on and on. But um, when you hear something that resonates with your spirit, like that really rings true to you, give it some hearts. Give it some love. It's just an affirm. I'm not going to see it. It doesn't really matter. But it's just an affirmative thing that you can do on your end, an action step that you can take on your end that allows you to say, yep, I received that. Yep, I want to integrate that. It's a way for you to partner with what's being given. Okay? So to make sure everybody understands how Goddard works, why it's important, and how you should interact with the material. Once again, we're reading from Resurrection, the specific book, Prayer, the Art of Believing. Let's go to church. Chapter one is going to blow your mind if you're listening. Chapter one, the law of reversibility. Prayer is the master key. A key may fit one door of a house, but when it fits all doors, it may well claim to be the master key. Such and no less a key is prayer to all earthly problems. Quote, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. It's a quote by Tennyson. Pray for my soul. Pray for me. More things are achieved. More things are accomplished by prayer than this world can even dream of, Tennyson is telling us. Prayer is an art that requires practice. The first requirement of this art is a controlled imagination. We're going to talk about the imaginal mind, which I love to talk about, but that's the first requirement. You have to have control over your imagination. Parade and vain repetitions are foreign to prayer. What he means by parade and Vain repetitions are essentially pomp and circumstance and just repeating a prayer over and over automatically. The reason this is ineffective is because automatic prayer is empty prayer. It's not alive. We're simply reciting things. Now, I do want to just make one point about mantras because mantras, we say, in repetition, but we're doing that in order to clear the mind. We're actually using a tool of repetition, which is not necessarily prayer. It's a kind of prayer, but it's not the prayer we're talking about. We're using the tool of repetition to let the thoughts fall away so that we can then enter into that communal relationship with source. We can use mantras for that. But the kind of prayer Neville is talking about does not include repetition or these vain types of prayer or these prayers of pomp and circumstance where we have priests in robes giving benedictions and nobody's listening and we're supposed to respond and so to you or also with you or whatever. Nobody's thinking about what they're actually saying for the most part and that's why it's not alive. Use not vain repetitions for prayer is done in secret and quote, thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The ceremonies that are customarily used in prayer are mere superstitions and have been invented to give prayer an air of solemnity. I love it. The prayers that we learned to save a wretch like me, the prayers that we learned in organized religion, were devised and created to give this air of importance, this air of solemnity, and yet they still are empty. Those who do practice the art of prayer are often ignorant of the laws that control prayer. They actually don't know why prayer works. We're going to get into that in this work. They attribute the results obtained to the ceremonies and they mistake the letter for the spirit. So they pray for something and they achieve something and they attribute the achieving of that thing to the ceremony, to the benediction, to the automatic prayer. They don't attribute it to what they should be attributing it to, which is what we're going to talk about, the imaginal mind and also the feeling. They're missing the actual formula. They mistake the form of the prayer, the letter of the prayer, the word of the prayer for the spirit. The essence of prayer is faith. But faith must be permeated with understanding 
to be given that active quality which it does not possess when it stands alone. Check it out. Let's read that again. The essence of prayer is faith, but faith has to be permeated with, saturated with, understanding in order to be given that active quality, that momentum truly, which it doesn't possess when it stands alone. Quote, therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. This book, Neville says, is an attempt to reduce the unknown to the known by pointing out the conditions on which prayers are actually answered and without which they cannot be answered. This book is going to define the conditions governing prayer in laws that are simply a generalization of our observations. And here's where he starts to get really funky with it. I love it. The universal law of reversibility is the foundation on which its claims are based. The universal law of reversibility, which we're going to learn about right now, is the foundation on which prayer actually works. Boop! I'd be listening if I were you. Mechanical motion caused by speech was known for a long time before anyone ever dreamed of the possibility of an inverse transformation or an opposite transformation. That is, the reproduction of speech by mechanical motion. For example, the phonograph he wrote this a long time ago, or digital types of recordings. For a long time, also, electricity was produced by friction without ever a thought that friction, in turn, could also produce electricity. Whether or not man succeeds in reversing the transformation of a force, he knows, nevertheless, that all transformations of force are reversible. We're going to explain this. I know this is a little convoluted. If heat, Neville says, can produce mechanical motion, so too can mechanical motion produce heat. If electricity produces magnetism, so too can magnetism develop electrical currents. If the voice can cause undulatory currents, so too can such currents reproduce the voice via recordings and otherwise, and so on. What he's saying is cause and effect, energy and matter, Action and reaction are the same and interconvertible. This law is of the highest importance because it enables you to foresee the inverse transformation once the direct transformation is verified. Stay with me, this is going to make sense. If you knew how you would feel were you to realize your objective or what it is that you want to manifest, if you knew how you would feel if you were to realize that, then Inversely, you would know that you would know what state you could realize were you to awaken in yourself such a feeling. The injunction to pray believing that you already possess what you pray for is based upon a knowledge of the law of inverse transformation, you see. If you realized if your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or state of consciousness, then inversely, that particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer. Let's break that down. If your prayer is, I want a million dollars, and when you get a million dollars, you are so happy, you are so abundant, you are loving your life, feeling prosperous, like the world is your oyster, then this principle, this law of reversibility, stands to reason that if you can achieve the feeling of feeling abundance, like the world is your oyster, and feeling so prosperous, you will attract to you one million dollars. If you can achieve the feeling of that which you seek to manifest, that is how you manifest it. You don't have to achieve it and then feel it. You feel it and then you achieve it. If your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or state of consciousness, then inversely, the particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer, that thing that you want. Because all transformations of force are reversible. You should always assume the feeling of your fulfilled wish. You should awaken within you the feeling that you are and have that which heretofore you desired to be and to possess. You should find a way, is what Neville is saying, to awaken within you, to begin to feel and exist in the vibration of that which you seek to be 
and that which you seek to have in order for that which you want to manifest to actually become yours. This is easily done by contemplating the joy that would be yours were your objective an accomplished fact so that you live and move and have your being in the feeling that your wish is realized. Let's read that again. It's powerful. This is easily done by contemplating, thinking on, and truly feeling, feeling the joy that would be yours were your objective or your goal an accomplished fact so that you live and you move and you have your being in the feeling that your wish is realized. Remember, Neville is the one who tells us that being and believing are one. So many of us say, I believe this, I believe that, but we don't actually exist in that belief. We don't actually vibrate to that belief. True belief is one with being. We live what we believe. And so he's telling us here, if we can find the feeling of that which we seek to be or that which we seek to manifest, if we exist in the belief of that, in, in the belief of that as if it were already done, that is the key right there to manifesting it. The feeling of the wish fulfilled, if assumed, meaning if you hook into that, and sustained, which means hold on to that, must objectify the state that would have created it. Now, when Neville says objectify, what he means is make an object out of, bring into the material reality. So to read that again, the feeling of the wish fulfilled, vibrating with the belief of it, with the feeling of it, if you can hook into it and hold on to that, will have to manifest the state that would have created it. This law explains why, quote, faith, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen and also why quote this is such a powerful scripture you should commit this to memory you should write this down this is a holy magical fire word scripture quote he calleth things that are not seen as though they were and things that were not seen become seen god calls things that aren't seen yet, as if they were, and the things that aren't seen become seen. And Christ said, if a man believeth, all things are possible to him who believes. And also it said, all things are possible for God, through God, all things are possible. It's possible for man, the consciousness of man. It's possible for God. And all we have to do is what God did when he created creation. He called that which was unseen, not created yet, as if it were. He interacted with it. He spoke to it. He assumed the energy of it, and so it was. And that which was unseen became seen. That is the law and the prophets of manifestation. That's what you have to learn how to do. We call this in this day and age, faking it until you make it. Now, faking it feels empty, right? It feels kind of hollow. We're not talking about that. We're talking about walking around the planet, vibrating with the belief that you're already that. I'm already successful. I'm already abundant. I'm already well. I'm already this or that. Whatever it is that you want to manifest in your life, the key is starting with the feeling of already being that, calling that unseen thing as if it were seen. That's how the unseen thing becomes seen. Do you see? That's the power of it. And truly, that is how creation works. Assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled and continue feeling that it is fulfilled until that which you feel objectifies itself, becomes an object, becomes a concrete fact. Again, assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled and continue to feel that. Don't just hook into it for five seconds and walk away. No, we got to hook in and sustain it. We have to stay in the vibration of it until that which you want to manifest manifests itself. It has to if you do this. If a physical fact can produce a psychological state, Neville says, then a psychological state can produce a physical fact. For example, I'm fat in my body and I'm bummed. <laughs> so if my physical state can produce a psychological fact, 
it stands to reason that my psychological state can also produce a physical fact. I can start with a feeling of being really bummed and soon I'll find myself packing on the pounds or soon I'll find myself falling out of alignment in the physical body because this law of reversibility is true. If the effect A can be produced by the cause B, then inversely, the effect B can be produced by the cause A. Therefore, I say unto you, quote, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you've already received them and you shall have them. What things soever that you desire, when you pray, believe that you already have them and you shall have them. That's magic. That's manifestation. Chapter two, the dual nature of consciousness, the dual nature of consciousness. A clear concept of the dual nature of man's consciousness must be the basis of all true prayer. Consciousness includes a subconscious as well as a conscious part. The infinitely greater part of consciousness lies below the sphere of objective consciousness. Objective consciousness meaning reality consciousness, that which we see that is objectified in the materiality. The subconscious, Neville says, is the most important part of our consciousness. It is the cause of voluntary action, the subconscious is. The subconscious is what a man is. The conscious is what a man knows. Did you catch that? The subconscious is what a man is. The conscious is what a man knows. Quote, I and the Father are one, but my Father is greater than I. The conscious and the subconscious are one. They work together in tandem, but the subconscious is greater than the conscious. It's the animator. It is the womb of creation. The conscious, Neville will tell us, is the thinking aspect of who it is that we are that sends the message to the womb of creation, the female subconscious. And she receives it and from that takes her directive and then she creates it. She has the power to bring that which we seek into our reality. That's what makes her greater than the conscious. Quote, I of myself can do nothing the Father within me, he does the work. What Neville has shown in many of his writings is that he regards Christ not so much as a man, a historical figure, but rather the conscious aspect of who it is that we are. And here Christ is saying, I, the conscious, the thinking man, I can't do anything. The Father within me, which is the subconscious, he's the one who does all the work. I, objective consciousness, of myself can do nothing, but the Father, the subconscious, he doeth the work. The subconscious is that in which everything is known, in which everything is possible, to which everything goes, from which everything comes, which belongs to all and to which all of us have full access. What we are conscious of is constructed out of what we are not conscious of. What we are conscious of, what we know in our reality, what we interact with in this materiality is made out of what we're not conscious of, that which exists in this domain of the subconscious. Not only do our subconscious assumptions influence our behavior, but they also fashion the pattern of our objective or outpictured reality. They alone have the power to say, quote, let us make man objective manifestations in our image after our likeness. The whole of creation is asleep within the deep of man and is awakened to objective existence by his subconscious assumptions. What Neville is saying here is that the whole of creation is asleep within the deepness of man and is awakened to reality, becomes reality through the subconscious and what the subconscious assumes. What do you think the subconscious assumes? The subconscious assumes what is transmitted to it by the conscious. I and the Father are one, but the Father is greater than me. Conscious is the male aspect of the consciousness, subconscious being the female. 
She receives the directive and then makes an assumption based on that. She never judges the directive. She never says, Crystal, you're thinking wrong thoughts, sweet pea. You're also feeling low vibration. And now you're transmitting a message to me, the subconscious, this womb of creation. And I'm not going to judge it. I'm just going to return unto you according to that directive. That's the assumption that she makes. Everything that you experience in your reality comes from the subconscious. Man is awakened to his or her reality through the animation, through the working of the subconscious. I said at the beginning, we have to understand how prayer works, why prayer works, why it's magical. And this is Neville taking us into that formula. Within the blankness we call sleep, there is a consciousness in unsleeping vigilance. I love that. Within the blankness that we call sleep, all conscious in our reality, there is a consciousness in unsleeping vigilance. And while the body sleeps, this unsleeping being releases from the treasure house of eternity the subconscious assumptions of man. And we know, we've learned, and it's true that the subconscious is alive when we go to sleep. When we go to sleep, all these thinking routines, these narratives, these loopings of the mind fall away and we enter into the domain of that creative womb. It's when we sleep that we're actually creating that which we experience in the days, weeks, and years to come. And this is the domain of the wife. This is the domain of the subconscious. I love this. Let's read it again. Within the blankness we call sleep, there is a consciousness in unsleeping vigilance. There is the mother. There is the subconscious. There is the father, if you will. And while the body sleeps, this unsleeping being releases from the treasure house of eternity the subconscious assumptions of man, the, uh, the subconscious assumptions of the conscious transmission, man. The thoughts that we sent to the subconscious. She releases that from the treasure of eternity. She manifests from there. Prayer is the key which unlocks the infinite storehouse. Quote, Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Prove me now herewith, test me, says God, if I won't open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and there shall not be room enough for you to receive it. That's what waits for you. Prayer modifies or completely changes our subconscious assumptions, that which the subconscious has received and then animates or creates. And a change of assumption is a change of expression. And truly, it is a change of existence. Change what you transmit to the subconscious and you change the experience of your life because she's the one who creates your experience. The conscious mind reasons inductively from observation, experience, and education. It therefore finds it difficult to believe what the five senses and inductive reason deny. What he's saying here is our senses say our life's like this. Our senses say the world's like this. Our senses say my bank account is this. My senses tell me my body's wellness is this. And so the conscious mind, the thinking aspect of who it is that we are, reasons inductively from observation, experience, and education. We find it difficult to believe what the five senses and inductive reasoning will deny. The subconscious reasons deductively, not inductively, and is never concerned with, is never concerned with the truth or the falsity of the premise, but rather proceeds on the assumption of the correctness of the premise and then objectifies results which are consistent with the premise. Yo, that's a lot of words, but we got to go into that because it's a big deal. The subconscious reasons deductively. It's not concerned with the truth or the falsity of the premise. It's not concerned with the goodness or the badness of the transmission of the thoughts and the feelings. It's not concerned with the rightness or the wrongness. It 
presumes, it assumes that what it receives is what it's going to do. It doesn't judge it. It's not a respecter of persons. This distinction must be clearly seen by all who would master the art of prayer. No true grasp of the science of prayer can be really obtained until the laws governing the dual nature of consciousness are understood and the importance of the subconscious is realized within you. Prayer, the art of believing what is denied by the senses, deals almost entirely with the subconscious. Prayer, the art of believing what is denied by the senses. My bank account is filled with money. My senses deny this, but I believe it. And believing and being are one. Believing and existing in the vibration of that belief are one. They are the same. Belief without being is dead, is not active, and is not alive. Through prayer, the subconscious is suggested into acceptance of the wish fulfilled and reasoning deductively logically unfolds it to its legitimate end. Far greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Far greater is the subconscious that's within you than that which you perceive in this world. Far greater than is she that is within you. Let's call it what it is, she. The subconscious is the mother. Subconscious is the womb of creation. Far greater is she that is within you than what you can see in this world. The subjective mind is the diffused consciousness that animates our entire world. It is the spirit that gives us life. In all substance is a single soul subjective mind. Through all creation runs this one unbroken subjective mind. Thought and feeling fused into beliefs impresses modifications upon it, charges it with a mission, which mission it faithfully executes. The conscious mind thinks the thought and has the intention. The conscious mind impresses this intention on the subconscious mind, which then animates it. The subjective mind unfolds them to their logical ends. Were the subjective mind not so limited in its initiative power of reasoning, objective man could not be held responsible for his actions in the world. Man transmits ideas to the subconscious through his feelings, the subconscious then transmits ideas from mind to mind through telepathy. Your unexpressed convictions of others are transmitted to them without their conscious knowledge or consent, and if subconsciously accepted by them, will influence their behavior. Now that's magic. Did you just catch that? Your unexpressed convictions of others are transmitted to them without their conscious knowledge or their consent. And if subconsciously accepted by them, because they feel it, it's a vibratory transmission, it will influence their behavior. You walk around the planet with beliefs about people, beliefs about your family members, beliefs about your friends and your enemies. That belief is also in your being. You vibrate in alignment with what you believe, and that is a signal. That signal is targeted to the person you're believing that about. And they receive it. It's a vibration. And depending on where they're at, they can accept that and it changes the circumstance, the condition, and their reality. This is powerful. If we hold a belief within ourselves, and if we vibrate or feel in accordance to the belief, and we hold the utmost vision of our neighbor, of our lover, of our child, we hold them in the utmost vision for their highest good, and we vibrate to it, we transmit that goodness to them. We help them get a leg up. We help them to heal. This is the key to all healing. All of you energy workers out there, Reiki practitioners, hands-on healers, the the foundation of your healing is holding in your belief, in your energy, the vision, the beingness, the existence of this person healed, whole and well. You vibrate to that. 
you send it to them and it changes their reality if they accept it. Now, healers we know, some people don't accept that. Some people will say, nope, I don't want that. But those who are ready for a healing will receive it. This is how you can, re this is how you can heal relationships with estranged parties by holding them in this belief of goodness, the utmost for their highest and transmitting that to them. It's powerful. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. Ideas are best suggested when the objective mind is partly subjective. That is, when the objective senses are diminished or held in abeyance, for example, through meditation. When we meditate, we are closing ourselves off to the objective mind, the objective reality, that which we see, that which is going on. We quiet the mind. We hold that in abeyance. This partly subjective state can best be described as controlled reverie. I don't know if you've ever been in that sweet spot of meditation. That's a controlled reverie and that controlled part's important, isn't it? Because when you hit the sweet spot of meditation, it's kind of hard to stay there sometimes. You're just trying to just hang out in this controlled reverie. That's what he is talking about. This partly subjective state can best be described as controlled reverie, wherein the mind is passive, but capable of functioning with absorption, capable of receiving, capable of integrating and taking it in. It is a concentration of attention. There must be no conflict in your mind when you're praying. Can't be thinking about all this other stuff, all your objective reality woes. There can be no conflict when you are praying. Turn from what is to what ought to be. Assume the mood, the vibration, the frequency of fulfilled desire. How are you going to feel when you get that million bucks? Man, you're going to be happy. Get there now. Do that now and you receive the million bucks. And by the universal law of reversibility, you will receive your desire. Friction creates electricity. Electricity creates friction. Both of these things are reversible. And so what he's saying is with prayer, we reverse it. We pray as if we already have it and then we get it. That's the important thing to understand. We do not drop to our knees, saved a wretch like me. We don't go to the interaction through prayer to commune with source energy and our higher self as a beggar. We go fully empowered, seeing and occupying and being, existing in the energy of already being all of that. We reverse it and that's how we get it. It's an immutable, universal, spiritual principle and law. It's chapter three from this book by Neville Goddard, Resurrection, which I encourage you to purchase. And from the book within it called Prayer, The Art of Believing, chapter three is imagination and faith. Remember, Neville reminded us that faith is the substance of things not seen. It's the substance, it's the energy, it's the transmission. We can't see it with our eyes. He calls the unseen as if it were seen. That's what faith is. It's the substance of things unseen and the evidence of things that we hope for. The concrete fact of that which we hope for, that is what faith is. Neville says, prayers are not successfully made unless there is a rapport between the conscious thinking and the subconscious mind of the operator. This is done through imagination and through faith. By the power of imagination, all men, I, I, I wanna say women, he's always saying men. I'm gonna try and switch that up a little bit. Somebody said thank you for that on YouTube. Thank you for using women because a lot of these old timey power of positive mind books were just so centered around men and male speak but we women are up in here we women are we usually are the ones kind of at the forefront of spiritual change and way showing so let's refer to ourselves as such by the power of imagination all women all people certainly imaginative women are forever casting forth enchantments and all women especially unimaginative women are continually passing under their power. This is really powerful. 
I want to say this again, by the power of imagination, all people, certainly imaginative people, are forever casting forth enchantments. They're forever creating. They're forever manifesting. And all people, especially unimaginative people, are continually passing under their power. They're unconscious. They're just receiving it. They're living under what somebody else is manifesting. Can we ever be certain that it was not our mother while darning our socks who began that subtle change in our minds? If I can unintentionally cast an enchantment over persons, there's no reason to doubt that I am able to cast intentionally a far stronger enchantment. Everything that can be seen, touched, explained, argued over is to the imaginative person nothing more than a means, for he functions by reason of his controlled imagination in the deep of himself, the subconscious of himself, where every idea exists in itself and not in relation to something else. In him there is no need for the restraints of reason, of the senses. He doesn't need that. For the only restraint he can obey is the mysterious instinct that teaches him to eliminate all moods other than the mood of his fulfilled desire. The only restraint that he obeys or that she obeys is the mysterious instinct of the subconscious that teaches him to eliminate all moods, all feelings, all beliefs other than the mood, feeling, or belief of his fulfilled desire. That's the person who casts strong enchantments through the subconscious animator. Imagination and faith are the only faculties of mind needed to create objective or outpictured conditions. The faith required for the successful operation of the law of consciousness is a purely subjective faith and it's attainable upon the cessation or the stopping of active opposition on the part of the objective mind of the operator. It depends upon your ability to feel subjective faith. It depends upon your ability to feel and accept as true what your objective senses deny. Neither the passivity of the subject nor his conscious agreement with your suggestion is necessary. For without his consent or knowledge, he can be given a subjective order which he must objectively express. This is magic. It is a fundamental law of consciousness that by telepathy, we can have immediate communion with another person. To establish rapport, you call the subject mentally. Focus your attention on him and mentally shout his name just as you would to attract the attention of anyone. Imagine that he has answered and mentally begin to hear his voice. Represent him to yourself inwardly in the state that you want him to obtain. Are you listening? This is powerful. Represent him to yourself inwardly in the imagination in the state that you want him to obtain. Then imagine that he is telling you in the tones of ordinary conversation what you want to hear. You mentally then answer him. Tell him of your joy in witnessing his good fortune. Having mentally heard with all the distinctness of reality that which you wanted to hear and having thrilled to the news when you heard it, return then to objective consciousness, back to reality. Your subjective conversation must awaken what it affirmed. Your subjective conversation must awaken within you what it affirmed. This is a two-way process. You can imagine yourself having a conversation with someone and in this imagination, this exercise and visualization, you see this person as you want them to be in the state that you desire for them to be in, giving you that job, saying yes to that offer. You imagine yourself actually having a conversation with them and it has to be distinct. It has to feel like reality. You have to visualize it and feel it as you do it. If you do this, it has to, it is awakened. It has to be awakened in the person and within the circumstance. 
Quote, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. It is not a strong will that sends the subjective word on its mission, so much as it is clear thinking and feeling the truth of the state affirmed. It's not a strong will. It's not sitting there endeavoring, trying hard to manifest that actually manifests. So much as it is clear thinking, knowing what it is that you want, being able to visualize in the imaginal mind what it is that you want to create, and feeling, vibrating, existing in the energy of the state affirmed. When belief and will are in conflict, belief invariably wins. Mic drop. When belief and will are in conflict, belief is always going to win. If it is your will to be successful, but your belief, your programming, your bodies within the body tell you that you are a failure, because maybe your father told you that, maybe somebody told you that along the way, maybe you failed a few times and now you're just stuck in this loop of thinking you're a failure, your belief invariably will win. Your will will not. Being and believing are one. The only way to activate the principle of that which you believe in your life, to, which means to outpicture it, to see it in the life, is to live it and feel it now. The belief will invariably win. It doesn't matter how great your intention is. It doesn't matter how skilled you are, how long you went to school. All of that doesn't matter if the belief that exists, the body within the body, is telling you you're going to fail. The belief is going to win in the end. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, not by trying and endeavoring, not by strength and power, but by spirit, says source energy, says God. It's not what you want that you attract. You attract what you believe to be true. And to take it even farther, you attract what you are. You attract how you exist. You attract in alignment and in accordance to that. Therefore, get into the spirit of these mental conversations. Get into the feeling of these mental conversations and give them the same degree of reality that you would a telephone conversation that you would have. Quote, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you've already received them, and you will have them. That directly from Christ consciousness. The acceptance of the end wills the means. Mic drop number two. <laughs> the acceptance of the end, the being with, the reality of the end brings the means. I am accepting my glory. I am accepting my strengths. I am accepting my talent and the means come to me. The doors are opened to me. The resources come to me. The opportunities come to me because I've accepted. I started with accepting that which I truly want to be. How powerful is that? The acceptance of the end wills the means and the wisest reflection could not devise more effective means than those which are willed by the acceptance of the end. Mentally talk to your friends. Visualize conversations with your friends as though your desires for them have already been realized. And I also say as though you, the desires that you have for yourself are already realized. I'm sitting down with Christy Olison and we're talking and I'm like, girl, you look beautiful. You're so healthy, man. You're succeeding in life. So am I, Christy. I've got this thing coming up. I've got this project. I'm so happy, Christy. I'm so well, Christy. And I'm having this intense visualization where I can feel Christy, see Christy, see me and feel me. And that's a telepathic transmission. I send that to Christy and Christy receives that unless she actively opposes it. And I receive that. I receive the benefit of how it is that I picture myself in the inner world. That's how I create it for myself, but also for Christy. Imagination is the beginning of the growth of all forms. 
and faith is the substance out of which they are formed. Imagination, which is to think it. Thoughts are things, right? They have a substance. Imagination is the beginning of anything that's ever going to take form, and faith, belief, and being are one. Faith is the substance, the transmission out of which they're formed. By imagination, that which exists in latency or is asleep within the deep of consciousness is awakened and it's given a form. The cures attributed to the influence of certain medicines, for example, relics and places as well, are the effects of imagination and faith. This is what we call the placebo effect. The cures attributed to some of these, method, these medicines are a result of imagination and faith, somebody believing that they're healed, somebody occupying the vibration of, oh, I just took this medicine and it healed me, therefore it does. The curative power is not in the spirit that is in them, it is in the spirit in which they are accepted. Quote, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. So, whether the object of your faith is true or false, right or wrong, good for you or bad for you, you will get the same results. There's nothing unsound in the theory of medicine or in the claims of the priesthood for their relics and holy places. The subjective mind of the patient accepts the, the suggestion of health conditioned on such states. And as soon as these conditions are met, proceeds to realize health. According to your faith be it done unto you, for all things are possible to him that believeth. According to your faith, according to the way that you're believing, according to the way that you are existing, According to your faith is it done to you, for all things are possible to him that vibrates in alignment with what he or she believes. Confident expectation of a state is the most potent means of bringing it about. The confident expectation of a cure does that which no medical treatment can accomplish. These are what we call miraculous healings, confident expectation, or rather standing in the energy of being fully healed, does that which no medical treatment can accomplish. Failure, Neville says, is always due to an antagonistic auto-suggestion by the patient, arising from objective doubt of the power of the medicine or the relic, or from doubt of the truth of the theory. Many of us, either from too little emotion or from too much intellect, both of which are stumbling blocks in the way of prayer, can't believe that which our senses deny. We just can't believe that it's possible. To force ourselves to believe will end in greater doubt. Neville says, to avoid such counter-suggestions, the patient should be unaware, objectively, of the suggestions which are being made to him. Because if the patient knows that the suggestions of healing are being made to him, the patient can start to spin out and look at the objective reality, but I feel really sick, but this has been happening, and now I'm doubting, and does not receive the blessing, does not receive the ultimate healing. The patient should be unaware objectively of the suggestions which are being made to him. The most effective method of healing or influencing the behavior of others consists in what is known as, quote, the silent or absent treatment. When the subject is unaware, for example, with the placebo effect, objectively, of the suggestion given to him, there is no possibility of him setting up an antagonistic belief. He doesn't have the chance to doubt. He's unaware of it. He doesn't have the chance to disbelieve. The subject subconsciously accepts the, sub the suggestion and thinks that he originates it, proving the truth of Spinoza's dictum that we know not the causes that determine our actions. The subconscious mind is the universal conductor which the operator modifies, the operator being you, with her thoughts and her feelings. Visible states are either the vibratory effects of subconscious vibrations within you 
or they are the vibratory causes of corresponding vibrations within you. Let's read that again. Visible states, states we are in, are either the vibratory effects of subconscious vibrations within you, they are the animations of the subconscious within you, or they're the vibratory causes of corresponding vibrations within you. They're going to be causing an effect within you. A disciplined person never permits them to be causes unless they can awaken in him desirable states of consciousness. With a knowledge of the law of reversibility, the disciplined person transforms her world by imagining and feeling only what is lovely and of good report. The beautiful idea she awakens within herself shall not fail to arouse its affinity in others and in her own life. She knows the savior of the world is not a man, but the manifestation that would save. Wow. She knows the savior of the world is not a man. However, it's the manifestation that would save. The sick man's savior is health. The hungry man's savior is food. The thirsty man's savior is water. He walks in the company of the savior by assuming the feeling of his wish fulfilled. By the laws of reversibility, that all transformations of force are reversible. Friction causes electricity, electricity causes friction. The energy of feeling awakened transforms itself into the state imagined. The energy or the feeling of already being that awakens the manifestation into the reality. He never waits four months for the harvest. If in four months the harvest will awaken in him a state of joy, then inversely, the joy of the harvest now will awaken the harvest now. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? He doesn't have to wait. He can have it now if he can feel it now. Now is the acceptable time, my friend, to give beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, and praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness. That's powerful. He calls that which is unseen as though it were seen and the unseen becomes seen through god all things are possible if a man believeth he can have it if you pray believing that you already have it you will have it the avatars of yore have been teaching us this entire time organized religion and the systems and group think of man have put us in this Borg mentality, where we think that prayer is supplication. Prayer is asking, please, please, master, you are the master. You are all gods. The power is within you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Seek first the kingdom of that. Practice being what you say you believe. I started this live by talking about somebody who responded to one of my emails, which was eminently kind, and just basically crapped all over me. That person is not being what they say that they believe. They're existing and vibrating and doing and acting from an orientation that is not in alignment with that which they truly seek to be. And the soul's urge always seeks to go higher. The soul's urge always seeks that communion with higher self and source energy. And the communication which comes out of communion, the intimate interaction between two souls, that communication is our prayer. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship with somebody who didn't see you as you saw them, who didn't see in themselves the greatness that you saw in them who saw themselves as less than, not worthy of. How can I be, how can I receive approval? What can I do? I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship with someone like that, but it's kind of a trip. And that relationship can never be equal. That relationship can never be powerful. That relationship can never be co-creative, not fully, not truly because there's not a true communion taking place. One of those people is entering into the interaction and the communication like a beggar. 
like a beggar. Some of us do this in our marriages. Some of us do, do this in our love relationships and in our friendships. We enter into and stay in these relationships like a beggar, taking the scraps that they give us not equal, not in true communion. And flip that a little bit, because this has happened to me. You know, I'm not a famous person by any stretch of the word, but I've gone out to events and I've met people and I've seen how they interact with me. And they, it, some people interact with me as if I'm in possession of something that they are not. As if I know more than they do. I'm higher vibration than they are. I'm some kind of a great teacher. Like I, I've met people who have talked to me from that orientation and place. God bless them, that's fine, that's where they are. But I can never be in an equal friendship or relationship with a person like that because they don't see themselves as I see them. They don't see themselves as equal to me. They're coming as a beggar to some degree. If you wanna have a co-creative relationship with the source of all things, see, that's what God is. He's the source of all things, miracles. If that's what you wanna see in your life, if that's what you wanna manifest in your life, you have gotta come into that communication and into that relationship as an equal partner, because that's what you are. You have to come into that relationship as a friend, as a lover would, same level. And now we're cooking with gas. Now we are operating on all cylinders. You don't come to prayer as a beggar. You understand that the mechanism of the manifestation, that which you seek to objectify in your reality, to see as an object in your reality, a new love relationship, for example, a new job for yourself, a new number in your bank account. You come to that prayer with power, knowing that you create that. Christ is the conscious, the thinking aspect. The Father, which is the mother, is the subconscious. I and the Father are one, but the Father is greater than me. Nothing comes into this world except through the Father. And you have to know that that exists within you. Within you, you see, is this trinity of creation. Let us make man in our image. God didn't say, let us make man in my image. There were other parties involved. Guess who they were? You. You and you and you, also the archangels, that's another story, but you and you and you. Let us make Crystal Ann Compton in our image. And so they did. And within me, because I am the image of that which created me, within me, fully stocked, is everything I need to also be the creator of my life. See, I come from the source of all things. I'm the child of the source of all things, created in the image of the source of all things. And therefore, my birthright is to create the same in my own life. And it's the power within me, me, and only me. I and the Father are one. Are you feeling that? Do you love that? Can you sense that? That's how powerful we are. I receive a lot of letters from all over the world, people saying, Crystal, you know, this is going on in my life. I really need help. I get a lot of people asking for help, way more now than I ever used to. And I used to spend hours, like a week, just trying to ask, answer all these people, but it's, it's getting away from me, people. But I hear people in the way that they speak, and I, I have to say, you've you got to change the way you speak about yourself. Just the other day in a private communication with somebody who might be on this broadcast, someone said to me, I have nothing to teach anybody. And I said, ah, what did you just say? Read that back to yourself. I have nothing to teach anybody. And so it is. And so it is because as a man speaks, so he is. As a woman speaks, so she is. We have to get really clear about the fact that we are in the power position of our lives. We are the ones who are in control of the circumstances and conditions, the relationships and the people, the opportunities and the lack thereof. We are in control of all of that. And until we see ourselves as that powerful, as until we look away from this idea of the wretch, the beggar, crawling to the altar, genuflecting until we see ourselves as the co-creative powerhouse, well, nothing is going to change. Nothing's going to change. And that's what my work is to show you who you truly are and show you what's possible in your life. Adopt the feeling of already being that, believing and being our one. So what do you believe in, hon, about yourself? 
What are you believing about your marriage? What are you believing about your talents, your abilities, your prospects? What are you believing about this world? What are you believing about this country? What are you believing about your neighbor, about another race? What are you believing? Because believing and being are one. And from this space of active faith, you are creating your reality, not just yours, but you're also creating mine. Because as you feel it, see, as you imagine it, you telepathically transmit that to me and everybody else. As spiritual people, we gotta wake up. As a collective consciousness, we have to change what we're saying, the messages we're sending, to our subconscious through the way that we're existing. What if that woman had sent me an email and said, hey, by the way, I thought I unsubscribed, but I didn't. So maybe is there something I can do? Hey, I love what you do. Thank you for everything that you do. Like how much different would that have felt if she would have occupied the vibration of what she truly wants to be in this world? How much of a blessing could she have truly been? And God bless her, I'm using her as an example. I just want everybody to be cognizant of the impact of the inner world and how it's outpictured in every conceivable way in the objective reality. That which, ex that which exists within you is outpictured, manifested in your world. And tonight when you go to bed and all your thoughts fall away and the mind doesn't have all the mechanisms to doubt and to keep out the subconscious and the, the voices, the message of spirit, that's when your subconscious, your lover, your mother begins to dance like Peli is doing right now in Hawaii on the big island. She's dancing, man. She's creating destructive too, right? But she's creating. That's the power of your subconscious. Tonight, when you go to bed, you are entering into a magical time, the domain of the subconscious. In order to utilize this magical time, prime yourself. Have an intention. Run through the conversation that Neville taught us tonight in this work. The mental conversation, me and Christy Olison, seeing ourselves the utmost for the highest, talking in the language of our success, spend some time creating in the imaginal mind and feeling it in the belief, in the existence, and send that to the subconscious and boom, go to sleep and let her dance let her dance and thus we change the world mahalo guys <laughs>